Well, now we move on to the final fund manager of the day. Uh, we'll be speaking to Anthony Sedgwick. Um, he is going to be talking to us about the Rainmaker Fund, and of course, he's from ABEX. Um, Anthony, thank you so much for your time. Very much appreciated. Um, we'll try again, once again, to uh, to get just a quick comment or a question in. Uh, but as of late last year or September last year, to be more specific, uh, we saw the fund open up to, you know, offshore um, equities. I think what will be interesting to, you know, to gauge from you and to gain more insights from you in terms of this presentation is um, how, you know, how, how critical uh, stock selection has been and also uh, the, the great benefits that you've gotten from your regional diversification, especially at the time when we saw the rand come under pressure so i'm going to hand over to you and uh yeah please take it away thank you very much for the introduction and uh good morning everybody for those of you who've held on for the last one um in the next um, 10 or 15 minutes um, i'm going to try and address the que those questions uh, and give you a bit of an update about what we've been doing in uh, in rainmaker and, and particularly just the the second quarter of 2021 and uh, some of the events that uh, we've seen. So this is an update of a chart I actually showed in the in the previous presentation, and it's really you know interesting. It sees our equity market in a sort of a medium term context. Um, but what you can see illustrated as trapped between those two yellow lines is how for such a long period of time our market really effectively just went sideways between that range of fifty to sixty thousand. And you'll all know that during that time, there were a, not only where we trapped in this range of sort of ups and downs, but unless you'd had, you know, a lot of mining stocks and a bit of NUSPAS, everything else did, you know, really, really poorly. There were a lot of bullets to dodge, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, uh, corporate disasters in South Africa. And during this time, you know, a lot of long term, long suffering investors in our equity market, I think, really started to question the ability of the South African equity market to, to be uh, a source, a hedge against inflation, a place where one could invest capital and uh, and achieve a reasonable degree of growth, certainly staying ahead of inflation, when for about six or seven years during the, the so-called um, lost, almost lost decade of economic growth um, domestically in South Africa under the Zuma years, we, we, we really went nowhere. Uh, and then and then along came the COVID crash, um, which uh, was, as you know, in March of last year. And we've seen the subsequent very strong recovery, fortunately broken through that 60,000 level, starting to regain um, its reputation as an ability of a place where you, you can invest in as the South African equity market. And the little blue line just shows, you know, in the last quarter where we've just been moving sideways. Um, and that's largely as the sort of you know period of of euphoria from the recovery from the trough uh, from the COVID trough starts to wear out. We've seen the vaccine rollout program in South Africa stutter along. Uh, was stopped and starts the tragic events of the last week um, in parts of the country, obviously uh, having an impact on that. Um, but pleasingly, some undeniable, very positive political progress um, after a very very long time. Um, looking into the second quarter from Rainmaker's perspective in a little bit more detail, um, some things that worked and didn't work in the portfolio. If we look at some of the broad sectors in that table on the top right hand side, you can see the market in the quarter led by the financial stocks, uh, principally uh, a bounce in, uh, in our domestic property um, uh, uh, exposure from a very low base. I saw Saul referring that to the end of his uh, presentation. Uh, we've had very limited exposure, not an area that in Rainmaker we're ever likely to have substantial exposure to, and, um, and so we didn't have any of the benefit from that. Um, our winners, very pleasingly, were um, MTN and Capitec. Really pleasing to see um, uh, two of our international stock picks making it into the top five contributors there in the second quarter. Um, on the negative side, we saw the uh, the platinum stocks take a bit of a breather as uh, some of the PGM prices rolled off uh, very high levels. Um, but we saw that the Anglo Platinum production report um, earlier today bang in line with what our expectations are. The very 
important thing with the next set of reporting, which we'll start to see starting of next week, is the extent to which shareholders are seeing this cash being returned to us. We expect the majority of our return to come from a return of cash to shareholders rather than further capital appreciation. NUSPAS also there as a Q2 loser. Um, the stock really um, um, moving sideways in the uncertainty of the proposed uh, transaction with process. This is a transaction that we remain uh, you know, very disappointed by. Um, our concerns around the governance standards at both NUSPAS and process uh, you know, continue to rise from a very high base. We see very little merit in the transaction. We did oppose it. Um, it's, it of course is a moot point because NUSPAS used to use uh, the NUSPAS board used their um, high voting shares to force the transaction through on share, shareholders, notwithstanding the fact that 47% of us voted against the, uh, the transaction, which I think is an appalling indictment of uh, of the governance of the organization and the the merit of the transaction um we're now faced with the um you know with our backs a little bit against the wall in that we worry if we don't tender our tent our nuspas shares into the um, offer that nuspas is going to be left as an orphaned asset here in south africa with the action now and management's attention more clearly uh, more uh, you know clearly um, much more uh, focused on process, even though essentially they're the same thing. Um, and in the meantime, you know, the valuation just continues to, why the valuation gap or the NAV discount trapped in the structure uh, continues to rise. And so that, again, is another extremely disappointing aspect of notwithstanding management's stated priority to address the NAV structural discount that every step that they've implemented over the last two or three years has done nothing but exacerbate the problem, while at the same time their remuneration has continued to increase. Literally billions of rands of shareholder value trapped in the structure. I've made the point around the platinum stocks, which remain quite a big cumulative proportion of the fund. I'll run through that in a second, uh, where our question is, will we see the cash come through? Here, just to show you in a little bit more detail, is how the uh, the NUSPAS discount to its just uh, just to its listed assets. Um, you can see, you know, the the value of their listed assets as a percentage of total market cap has continued to rise over the last five or six years, uh, notwithstanding management's apparent attempts to, uh, to to rectify that. While at the same time, very pleasingly, ten cent which as we know is the dominant asset in the portfolio, uh, right now is actually trading at reasonably attractive levels. There's been uh, admittedly some uh, uh, rightful concern around a, an increase in the, regula the Chinese regulators uh, involvement and, um, and questioning of a variety of activities of, um, of many of the China's um, online businesses. We had historically felt that that level of regulation uh, of regulatory intervention was likely to be tempered by um, the Chinese state's desire to see some of their global champions uh, not negatively affected by unnecessary regulatory intervention. That opinion we certainly caused us to question that opinion based on the more recent activities. We have, however, drawn comfort that the ten cent as a business has been extremely, <coughs> excuse me, has been extremely diplomatic and extremely successful in negotiating the vagaries of uh, the regulatory relationship uh, in China in past. Uh, in the past, I would point to the example of their ability to to manage the issue around the uh, release or the temporary suspension of the release of new gaming titles when there was a regulatory change in China about two years ago. In the meantime, the valuation um, relative to its long term history is at, uh, at pretty attractive levels. And that chart on the left hand side actually understates the situation because during this time, Tencent has very successfully uh, built an investment portfolio of its own. Uh, all technology businesses all around the world um, 
many of which don't make uh, profits for the time being. And so cumulatively, they represent about 26% of 10 cents market cap at the moment. And if you strip that out, um, essentially the core business is trading at a, at a at a rating substantially lower than reflected uh, on the yellow, the yellow line on the left hand chart. Um, turning then to what we've been doing in the portfolio and um, and how we've continued to diversify and take advantage of the international um, allocation that the fund can um, avail itself of. Um, you'll know we started in September of last year. We got the green light for the first time. That's when we managed to get all of the admin complete. Um, we um, we wanted to make a, a reasonable start to begin with because we had the medium term budget policy speech coming in coming up in late October. So we moved quite quickly at that time. Uh, the RAND had already strengthened from around 19 to the dollar at the weakest point during the COVID um, scourge. Uh, the, or the COVID crash to around 16. We made a start at that point, and and by the end of October we had reached 15% uh, offshore. We've used the subsequent RAND strength to steadily increase the international exposure in the portfolio, which as of today is now about 27% uh, of the fund. Um, and what's been driving the strength in the RAND? Well, the point to make here is it's got nothing to do with um, the South African government. It's got nothing to improve, to do with, um, this, uh, you know, a, a change in, in policy. It's got nothing to do with international investors taking a more positive um, uh, stance towards South Africa. And it's all to do with this wonderful um benefit that we're getting from higher commodity prices. And that's clear to see um, in this chart, which shows the, the white line. These are all based to 100 on the left hand side. You can see the white line is the iron ore price, which you can see is up over three times. The palladium price, which is up nearly three times over this period. Um, and meanwhile, on the other side of the coin, our primary commodity import, which is oil, has been quite weak, and that's the green line that you can see below. And the gap between these two is just the positive trade balance effect that we're seeing with all of the proceeds of our export commodity prices, which are very high, coming back to South Africa, whereas the proportion of those that need to be used to spend on our import uh, commodity that we need, namely oil, has been low. And that shows you the delta then between those is the uh, is the RAND. You can see as it moves in one direction, the RAND weakens and moves in the other direction. Um, you see the RAND uh, continue to strengthen. And so the obvious question would be, how long can this last? Um, you know, we think it, it can last uh, for a reasonable period still. Um, I think it's important to bear the extent of the moves in, in, in mind. Um, they certainly do look quite stretched. If you look at rhodium, for example, the gold line shown in this chart, you know, it went from thirty uh, from $1,000 an ounce to $30,000 an ounce at its peak. It's come off that. It's trading about 18 and a half at the moment. It's a huge driver of profits for the PGM producers at the moment. We think in the sort of shortish term on the supply demand fundamentals and a recovery in uh, internal combustion uh, vehicle uh, manufacturer as we get through the worst of the semiconductor shortage that um, that's pretty supportive of these prices but undeniably they are at uh, at extremely high levels and we do worry that um, uh, it's not going to last forever and that's why we're focusing principally on measuring our return out of the PGM producers as the cash we're going to see distributed as dividends. Um, the chart on the right just shows the RAND dollar exchange rate. Um, the yellow line marks the period during which Rainmaker has had the uh, flexibility in its mandate to continue to invest offshore. And you can see we've used the ongoing strength to continue, as I've said, to increase our position now at 27% of the portfolio. Um, you know, the the other thing is that um, domestically, um, although we've seen very little evidence of an economic recovery, and and clearly the events of uh, in KZN and Gauteng of, of last week are going to be a further unnecessary headwind, what we are seeing 
is undeniably in parts of our uh, uh, in parts of the country a huge benefit of these very high commodity prices. Um, in the PGM producers, even thermal coal is at a record high level. Um, many of the rural areas in the big maize producing parts of the country um, with maize export prices at extremely attractive levels. Uh, agriculture and mining make up about 22-23% of GDP and largely that engine in our economy is absolutely thundering along at the moment. And in addition to that, um, we have seen uh, for the first time in, I can't remember how long, constructive policy decisions that have been taken with respect to South African Airways, Transnet, uh, the pr uh, private production of, of, of energy, the limits on that being increased. We're seeing progress on telco spectrum availability. And, and although the ANC government you know, mindset remains mired in this sort of central control uh, approach, there is progress. You know, SAA has effectively been privatized and there wasn't a peep from any of the unions. And we hope, and so the optimist in us would say, you know, th there are some clear signs of us moving in the right direction. And if this can gain some momentum, we think we could actually be looking at uh, a, a much rosier picture in the next couple of years. And right now, that's certainly not apparent as everybody's uh, minds um, and perspectives are very focused on the tragic events of uh, what happened in the last week. We try and look beyond that. And in that respect, uh, very, very uh, uh, pleased with the domestic exposure that we see in, in the fund, uh, both in the financial and in the industrial space. Um, so let's, as a final slide, I uh, just want to show you how, you know, kind of how the fund is positioned and where the bulk of that is. Um, I'm going to come back to the international thing just in the concluding slide, but important to note is that the resource space, this big block here in the sort of bottom left hand uh, corner of the pie chart, 24%, the big mining houses and, uh, and platinum producers largely, uh, very steady exposure still to domestic financials um, and, uh, and and industrial stocks. We're also very happy to note that, you know, despite um, some of the you know more, more negative opinion that we might have as as residents in the country, that uh, we uh, received a bid for our imperial shareholding from an international investor a week or two ago. Um, you'll note the big NUSPAS and British American Tobacco position on the so bottom right-hand quadrant here. And right now you can see the international exposure now up to 27% of the portfolio. And for the first time here, we're showing you on an absolute, you know, absolutely transparent look-through basis what those underlying holdings in Rainmaker are. These are the direct stock picks of the uh, positions that we that we own. The first column shows um, the weighting as a proportion of the overall fund. And then the second uh, column shows you, if you look at the international portion of the portfolio as a discrete bit, how would it look? And how would those weightings change if you look at it on a discrete basis? And I hope what you'll appreciate looking through it is that it's a pretty diversified portfolio. It's not particularly focused on any one region or industry um, uh, or um, or activity. Um, I really like the balance that we've got in, in global technology, very broadly defined, but you'll appreciate from a technology perspective, there's a huge difference in a business like Samsung in comparison to Google, in comparison to Microsoft, in comparison to Visa. Um, all of those um, you know, top five holdings I would broadly define as benefiting from the uh, an international or a global um, in increase in the use of technology, but clearly each one driven by completely different um, aspects of that um, inevitable process. I also really like um, the consumer exposure in the portfolio where we've picked some great businesses that we think have very long and attractive runways uh, of growth lying ahead of them in different areas. So Moncler as a luxury goods producer, 
um, you know, is a very good partner, I would say anyway, between our sports goods exposure between and, and a portfolio there um, weighted between Puma, Adidas and Li Ning as the as the underlying holdings. And in addition, as a final point is we're we're also got some you know decent exposure to uh, infrastructure activity where we're expecting an acceleration there in the United States as well as China. And we own in the US business called Martin Marietta, which I would simplistically describe as a bit like Afrimat in South Africa, but without the iron ore business. And Anhui Kunch, Kunch which is the um, largest cement producer in China and trades on a single digit PE. Um, I think we're running out of time. Um, I'll, I'll pause there and see if there are any final questions. Um, and uh, and or perhaps conclude with the last uh, slide here on entrepreneur, which you know is the mid and small cap fund. I'll just put it up and and ask you to cast your eyes across it, see if there's anything the point and 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 read the points uh, listed on the left hand side. I think they're all pretty self explanatory, um, and um, and see if there are any questions. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much for that. Um, unfortunately, time has uh, worked against us, but that was a, a very comprehensive presentation that you've put together. But uh, as we mentioned, uh, in the interest of time, I'm sure we're we'll just going to have to uh, stop it there. But again, thank you so much um, for your time. And I'm sure you will have uh, many other opportunities for us to engage and for you to, uh, I'm sure, take us through some of the questions that uh, we may still have, but weren't able to engage you with. Uh, thank you very much. Of course, that was uh, Anthony Sedgwick from ABAX uh, taking us through the Rainmaker Fund. Uh, we know that we are very much uh, you know, um, over uh, schedule, but uh, perhaps before we go, just a quick uh, roundup, just to summarize one or two points uh, from the you know, three fund managers that we've just had. Um, one being that, you know, although we have seen the global markets uh, or developed markets in particular have been expensive, uh, South Africa does still um, offer value there. And uh, one of the other points points that was uh, made by uh, some of our fund managers is that although uh, there definitely are some concerns around South Africa, uh, there certainly have been uh, you know, some movements in terms of momentum when it comes to economic reform. Um, Anthony already mentioning that in terms of the privatization of some of our state-owned enterprises and of course uh, you know, that uh, electricity generation uh, with that 100 megawatts that's uh, now being made available. And then of course we have had uh, commodity prices that uh, have both well or higher commodity prices that have boded well um, for South Africa. But I think across all three managers, we have seen the benefits of uh, diversification from both a regional or a sectoral perspective. While we will leave it at that for today, uh, that is it in terms of our session uh, of the local uh, fund manager workshop by NetGroup Investments. Tomorrow, do uh, join us while we take a look at our global fund managers. 